All right, it is seven o'clock on the dot. So I think we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Welcome to our history at home, modern architecture in and around Montclair. I'm glad you guys could all join us this evening. Uh, my name's Erin Benz. I'm the collections manager of the Montclair History Center. I'm co-hosting with Helen Fallon, who's our Montclair History Center trustee. Um, some of you who were on our last history at home or maybe got our email know that Jane is no longer with us us at the History Center. She's uh, got a different job elsewhere. She's not too far, but, um, and she's going to come back and volunteer. We already have her scheduled for some volunteer stuff already. So, uh, but we, we took on the mantle for her. So <laughs> of course, if you would like to donate, we're able to do these History at Homes for free. And we love that we're able to do this for free. We always appreciate your donations though. Um, you can donate through our website, MontclairHistory.org. Um, you can always send in a check to 108 Orange Road. We also have Venmo and Zelle. If you search Montclair History Center on Venmo or Zelle, will pop up. Um, um, anything I missed, Helen? No, I think you got everything. I just wanted to say a few words. First of all, great job with the introduction. Um, I'm sure Jane is, would be very proud. I'm actually scanning the list of participants. I'm like, Jane, are you here? <laughs> um, so we, as, as she mentioned, um, our executive director, Jane, has taken a new position outside the museum world, but we have already been in touch with her. Jane, how was your first day? Um, and so she's doing well, and we will see her um, here uh, and around the History Center. Um, and I just wanted to give you a teaser for the fall lineup, which um, we're, we're booking now. We've got a two-part back to school thing going on. I'm going to do some history, sort of a timeline of the district. Uh, Maciel Rodriguez Vars is going to do, um, is going to talk about her documentary, Our Schools, Our Town. Uh, we have another Olmstead themed presentation, this time a national focus. Um, and Dr. Chris Matthews is booked to, uh, well, to talk about his book and some other digs he's done around Montclair. And he will be on our Orange Road site, I think July 5th, doing a bit of a dig. So if anybody wants to um, stop by that day and we're in the process of booking the rest of the fall and um, see the rest of the fall schedule for History at Home. So um, stay tuned and we'll be in touch, but um, I'll just let Aaron introduce um, Kazis now so we can get going. Perfect. All right. So um, Kaziz Barnellis uh, taught history of architecture at the university level for 20 years and moved to Montclair to teach at Columbia University for 10 years and has published numerous books and articles on the topic. He's now retired from teaching. He's an artist exploring the intersections of new technologies and art, as well as photography, and has shown his work at places like the New Museum, Museum of Modern Art, and Contemporary Art Center in Vilnius, Lithuania. He lives in a modern deck house, and don't worry, he'll explain what a deck house is at the end on Highland Avenue with his family and continues to write about architecture. He's also the head of advocacy for Native Plant Society of Montclair. So New Jersey. As, oh, thank you. Sorry, New Jersey. Thank you. Um, so please, Kazis, take it away. Hey, thank you all. And thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, so I am going to um, start off uh, by talking about, uh, well, I'm going to, my whole talk is going to be about a survey of modernism uh, in architecture in Montclair and some surrounding communities until 1985. Um, I'm hardly an expert on this. I've only begun scratching the surface uh, really as an excuse. Uh, I actually came up with this talk, the idea to do this talk, so I would do it um, a few months ago and have uh, had a little bit of time to look into these things. Uh, this is very much a first draft, initial research into the topic. Already, it should be a two-parter, uh, and there are other architects uh, that I, there are many architects I don't include, important architects for the local communities like Milton Klein or Arthur Rigolo, and I'm really going to stick to Montclair and Glenridge with a couple of uh, outliers, but there's really great stuff out in the surrounding communities, particularly the Oranges, um, and so, uh, you know, this is hasty, it's quick, and um, it will be superficial, <laughs> but, but uh, again, it's a, a kind of a first survey on my part. Uh, and I really hope to bring attention to a lot of the modern architecture here because it is, um, it is worthy of um, historic attention and historic preservation either um, as, as well. I mean, uh, I'm going to start off at the outset by saying that, well, he's not technically really my godfather, but I call him that since he was my confirmation sponsor and he's Italian, but John Vinci, um, who I call my godfather is now 80, years old, lives in Chicago, um, and he was one of the first uh, people to be involved in preserving art, 
modern architecture, really any sort of architecture that wasn't a specifically historic site in the 1960s uh, in Chicago with buildings like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House, like Louis Sullivan's, uh, uh, various Louis Sullivan works, uh, the Stock Exchange Trading Room in Chicago is uh, his work. Uh, or his his it's Louis Solomon's work, but he brought it into the Art Institute, uh, the Arch there as well. So so it's you could say it's a kind of extended family tradition. But also I, uh, for those people who are like, well, why should we preserve modernism? Well, in the 1960s, uh, people in Chicago were tearing down buildings by Louis Sullivan. Of course, we lost in New York City, uh, Penn Station. These are buildings that were considered uh, unattractive and worthless, and yet now you know we wish we had some of them back. So. Um, I want to, again, this is kind of a project, as many of these talks over the years have been with the History Center. People give talks, uh, they start talking to the town, they establish historic districts. And I think we really need to think about this in the future for our town as well. Uh, that, that history didn't stop with uh, the Second World War, for example. This first building is the Frederick Taylor Gates House. It's at 66 South Mountain. I am sure anybody who lives in Montclair knows uh, knows it. It is a, a monument in town that um, ends uh, Highland, not Highland, it ends Hillside um, right, uh, right on South Mountain. Uh, it was constructed from 1902 to 1904 by George Mahar. I'm sure it's been in other uh, talks for the History Center before, but it's worth it, worth starting as a kind of beginning point for modernism in Montclair. Um, and it, it, it gets to also the fact that this isn't just a stylistic survey, but there also are uh, various kinds of themes that will recur, such as uh, an interest in Asian uh, architecture that may be superficial, that may be, um, we may criticize today in some ways, but nevertheless uh, was a part of uh, of history that in which we begin, in which Americans began to look at other cultures outside of Europe and value them, uh, and also so that's one thing theme we'll see here, and another, we'll see a theme also of trying to create an American architecture, and we'll also see a theme of a kind of progressive thought uh, for the clients. So th this is the Frederick Taylor Gates House, and. Again, it's constructed 1902 to 1904 by George Mahar. Uh, in the 1880s, Gates, uh, who's a young Baptist minister, uh, is in Chicago, and he's seeking to create a Baptist university to help educate people of his faith. Uh, and I didn't know this before I researched this house. Um, he met uh, John D. Rockefeller Sr., uh, widely considered one of the richest individuals in history and a devout Baptist, and uh, convinced Rockefeller to give funds to found a university that is now the University of Chicago. Uh, Gates becomes Rockefeller's advisor. Rockefeller says he's one of the smartest business, he's the greatest businessman he ever met, even though he's a Baptist minister and advisor. Uh, he moves out east to the New York City area to uh, help uh, manage Rockefeller's business interests outside of Standard Oil. And as he puts it to Rockefeller, you're gaining more and more money every year. Uh, you're eventually going to be buried in the avalanche of money as your, and so will your heirs. And so he encourages Rockefeller to give away the money, now, uh, or to give away a lot of the money, certainly not all. And also at the same time, uh, he feel there is a certain kind of quality of greenwashing here, uh, as we might call it today. Rockefeller and Standard Oil are very unpopular. Soon Standard Oil will be bro broken up uh, under one of the first major antitrust actions of um, the 20th century. But at the same time, uh, creating the Rockefeller Foundation uh, is, a, is a way to create, it is a real key step in creating the culture of found large foundations that we have today. Uh, part of this is also the effective altruism movement, which is quite popular today. Um, Gates was a pioneer in effective altruism, that is trying to figure out where your money can best be used, not just giving money to anybody. So, there, so he convinces Rockefeller to give money to causes that will be very effective for every dollar invested, such as eliminating hookworm in, this, in, uh, in the South, where it had been prevalent in, uh, and yet uh, largely ignored. Now, who is George Mahar? Mahar is a Chicago architect, and he works in the office of Joseph Silby for a time alongside a young Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Mahar actually develops the prairie style of architecture uh, in parallel with Wright and spins it his own way. 
Um, that prairie style, uh, we, will, we will look at it in a little bit more detail in a second in a building of rights. But let me start by saying there's a real interest in straight lines and in horizontal planes. Uh, although this building is on a hill in uh, New Jersey, it's supposed to reflect the horizontality of the Midwestern landscape. And um, the house does have a certain kind of real cubic simplicity to it that the prairie style houses often do. Uh, the, uh, there's also the horizontality, can be, you can see it emphasized. I'm going to start my laser pointer here. If you can see it, little red thing, it's emphasized in this cornice line below the third uh, level. It's like there's a, both a cornice and a kind of projection. The top proje the third floor projects outward a little, uh, plus a very low slung roof, and also this this uh, porch that comes off the side, sort of shooting off the side. Um, and so there's that. And the other thing is, as I said, there is a certain Asian influence, a Japanese influence here. Uh, and this is no, you can see it, I think, in this entrance, maybe in the kind of the general massing of the building might recall, um, sort of a Westerner's take on what Jap who'd never been to Japan might think. Uh, and, and that shouldn't be too unusual, actually, if you find out that once you find out that Silsby, the architect both Wright and Mahar worked for, was a cousin of a man named Ernesto Fenolosa, who was the leading early Western expert in Japanese art. And while living in Japan, uh, one of the first Westerners to live there, uh, helped found the Tokyo School of Fine Arts as well as the Imperial Museum in Tokyo. Uh, plus in 1891, the Japanese construct a pavilion at the 1891 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which gives young architects such as these two an opportunity to really see what, um, what relatively accurate Japanese architecture of the day might be, and to borrow from that liberally as a counter towards uh, what typical Western architecture. Uh, the Also, again, I mentioned the, the theme of an American architecture. Mohar in 1908 states, houses in this country should typify the American spirit. And that simplicity and vigor of American life at its best should be expressed in our dwellings. This does not mean the traditions of the past should be ignored, but they should be interpreted in new forms. He claimed he was looking for something he called an indigenous architecture. Now, compare it to this William Winslow house by Wright in River Forest, Illinois, uh, from 1893 to 94. I think you can tell it's extremely similar, uh, except uh, that you've added a story from uh, in the Gates house. Uh, Wright actually, this is one of Wright's buildings and it is called, he, Wright himself calls it the first prairie house. Uh, again, there's this kind of tripartite entrance. There's the, the kind of mo constant motif of three windows. Even the top projects, the low slung roof, roof even the porch comes out of the side. Um, everything is just a little bit more out of scale in this one. Um, both houses have uh, leaded glass windows with ornament built into them. Uh, these two architects are, are re remarkably similar. And although this one comes after Wright, um, I think that there is a bit of back and forth between them as well. Now I'm going to show you the interior a little bit. This is a period photograph. I don't have good photos of this. Uh, and with many houses, the interiors that I'll show today, the interiors are a challenge. Uh, in contrast to the stark exterior, the interior here, here seems to speak of a kind of um, well of wealth and of a kind of comfort, masculine domesticity. You imagine if he wasn't a teetotaler, which he may have been, was popular at the time, you imagine you might have had a good glass of whiskey and in either case a cigar probably sitting in the, on that couch. Um, and certainly wealth uh, is being communicated here. If you look at the, this is a rather strange slide because it's from a 1990s issue of Old House Journal and kind of a weird 90s graphic design at work. Uh, but you can see that this is an article on the renovation that took place there in the 90s. You can see this is a, a uh, the kind of the book matched uh, mahogany veneer uh, on, uh, actually uh, book matched veneer, I'm not, it is in mahogany. I might have it in my notes as to what wood this is. Um, and uh, which means by book match, which means it's symmetrical. You know, this this piece and this piece were cut from the same log, and um, they match each other. Uh, and this is uh, apparently by the Tiff. Or no, sorry, they are mahogany panels. Uh, they are by T the Tiffany Studios. Um, this is another image of the stair. So you know, this is no expense was spared in this property. Uh, I guess it was a good deal to be a head of Rockefeller's foundation. Uh, Mahar, however, has, uh, is 
almost certainly not introduced to Montclair by Gates, uh, since he already had done work a couple of years earlier in 1899 at this uh, Le A.B. Leach House in South Orange at 321 Scotland Road. Um, Arthur B. Leach is the head of a Wall Street firm, and um, the uh, this is a, a bit smaller. Again, you can see a similarity to uh, to the Gates House. Uh, those of you who are into architecture, uh, I believe this arch reminds me a bit of um, Sullivan's Arch at the um, at the Columbian Exposition. Uh, later on, there's a building in San Francisco that Wright uses a similar arch on uh, in the four, 30s or 40s. So. Um, a kind of motif uh, going back and forth between different architects. Um, unfortunately, after Leach's death in 1939, the house is demolished. Um, I don't know why a new house is built there in 1949, 10 years later. Again, the interior kind of speaks of wealth and speaks of uh, a kind of um, domesticity, a kind of in encompassing uh, quality, kind of comf uh, comfort and shelter from the outside. Here, the ar an arch motif is replaced, repeated over the fireplace. Uh, although there's also quite a uh, unusual room uh, that uh, has a, a what we, we would call today an Orientalist uh, or Arabesque, that is kind of a Western interpretation of um, of uh, mid mid Eastern uh, motifs. Um, but done very much with a kind of, if you know Louis Sullivan's work, with a kind of Sullivan-esque ornament. Um, so uh, rather, rather unusual uh, for the time, but again, showing the kind of the wealth uh, being displayed conspicuously here. Now, Mahar also does a third house in Glen Ridge, a little bit more modest at 90 Douglas Road, uh, home to William Tuttle Baldwin and Edith Crapo Baldwin. He's uh, a lawyer who works as counsel from the for the Customs Court in New York City. Uh, during the First World War, he volunteers for the Red Cross. Uh, and she's a suffragette. Uh, she uh, starts in the 1890s and continues on at least into the 19 teens. Um, she also is a poet and an artist, and she has many suffragette uh, and women's rights gatherings in the house. Um, so again, that kind of the, this continuation of a theme of progressive uh, clients. Uh, the interior, again, if much simpler, has this kind of oriental influence. And I'm using the term oriental not to be uh, offensive or anything, but that is literally the term in art history. It is the term used at the time. And again, we, if, if um, it is a question of the kind of a, a Western interpretation of Asian motifs, that is in many ways very fanciful. Um, and you can certainly critique it on its own terms um, or, or with our terms today. But again, you, 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 we, do, we should realize that this did help at least, you know, um, go against some uh, racist ideas that, you know, there's, there's nothing out there, there's nothing in, in Asia worth looking at. But in fact, um, there was a kind of real valuation of, uh, of Asian design. And this motif in the stairs is called the cloud lift or Chinese lift or oriental lift. It's this kind of two curves and then a major curve in the middle. Uh, it's if you go to the Gamble House in, um, in Los Angeles, right by USC, designed by Green and Green, a fabulous building. Um, is it by USC? I'm not forgetting. I may have just made that up. It may be in Pasadena. <laughs> I don't remember at all. Um, but um, but uh, this is a kind of a Western interpretation uh, again. And you will see that on the facade of uh, in the glass, in the leaded glass on the, uh, on the front door. Now, we're going to leave that behind and turn to another modern um, tradition, which is that of prefabrication. Um, this is 303 North, North Mountain on the right. It's right off of Anderson Park, a couple of houses south. Uh, it is uh, the Edison Lambie House, obviously Thomas Edison. Um, and uh, the house is for a man named Frank, Frank Dalton Lambie. And um, it is uh, Edison dreams uh, and Lambie both dream of mass production through the new technology of concrete. Uh, at that time, you could buy a whole arts and crafts house via the Sears Roebuck catalog. And so prefabricated houses weren't too crazy an idea. Um, and they thought that this would be a way of efficiently building, uh, building quite a few houses. And this was an experiment. Um, and I am told in the chat from Debbie that the Gamble House is in Pasadena. I realized that my memory was somehow very flawed on that. Um, in any case, um, the so thank you. Uh, in any case, the in 1914, uh, the Montclair Times writes that uh, has this article about taking this 
uh, the construction uh, of uh, the Edison Lambie House and using those methods to create concrete houses in on an 800 acre tract in Hasbrook Heights near Teterboro. Lambie and an investor named William Cooper hoped to uh, build low rent houses for poor people there. Uh, in the Montclair Times, he writes that uh, the Montclair Times writes that Cooper quote has made a deep study of the problem of housing the poor of a great city the great city of Manhattan Island, and feels a great step towards its solution will be achieved when the wastelands that are within sight of the metropolitan towers can be utilized for home sites. Uh, it's a great idea, and it totally fails. Uh, in 1915, Lambie wins a gold medal for invention from the Panama Pacific International Exposition. By 1916, many of his properties in Montclair are subject to sheriff's sales. So um, he doesn't do, do that. He eventually winds up developing parts of I believe Essex, um, West, West Essex County. Now, one thing that happens then is we're going to be skipping ahead. Uh, and the reason is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there aren't a great number of houses built in, um, of modern houses built uh, between the First World War and World War II uh, in Montclair and even throughout the country. Um, we really, their architecture schools tend to be very conservative, uh, tend to be building, they tend to be teaching uh, 19th century forms of architecture to their students well into the 1930s. Uh, there is, uh, there are not many, again, there are not many modern architects in this country period. There's not really any demand. And overall throughout the world, there isn't all as, as much as we might imagine. Most modernism that we see today is post-war. Uh, the, uh, in, in Montclair, certainly Normandy, Tudor, and Georgian style houses abound. Center Hall colonials are all the rage. Uh, and of course, you have to remember that the 1930s is the Great Depression, so not a lot gets built then. And then that's followed by World War II. So you have about, if you think of how bad we feel after COVID, you know, uh, and wanting to do something new, imagine 15 years and at the end of, the, of nothing, and at the end in rationing and tough times. And at the end of that, there, um, you're, during that time, there's little construction little innovation. And at the end of it, you're really going to feel that those styles of the past are outdated and you want to move forward. Um, so that sets us up for this. This is an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art uh, that takes place in 1932 by the architect, uh, well, future architect at the time. Um, I believe he was an art history graduate, um, Philip Johnson, uh, later to be well known for buildings like uh, the at and building in New York, uh, also the um, which is it called? It's now the Koch Center. It used to be called the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center. Uh, and the art historian Henry Russell Hitchcock. Uh, they together they mount the first show of modern architecture at the newly formed Museum of Modern Art. It is called Modern Architecture International Exhibit. And you can see that here's the architecture of uh, the uh, famous French architect Le Corbusier. They bring that in. They bring Frank Lloyd Wright somewhat reluctantly in, but he decides he wants the publicity. Uh, there's the architecture of uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, a German architect who will wind up emigrating to the US um, during the Nazi era and founding the School of Architecture that eventually becomes the School of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, and as well as Walter Gropius, who in the late 30s will wind up uh, running the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So you'll have these two major schools of architecture turning towards modernism. Uh, and it, it is a show that tours the country. I don't have a precise list of where it toured. It did appear, for example, in the Bullock's Wilshire store in Los Angeles. Um, and so it has some degree of success, um, but it certainly does not lead to a great burst of modern architecture in this country, at least not immediately. Um, and Johnson actually, after puttering about the Museum of Modern Art for another two years, I have to tell you, because I am one of the people who has done the most research on this, uh, if not the person who has done the most, um, after that, uh, for between 1934 and 1942, Johnson leaves the Museum of Modern Art, leaves architecture and art almost completely, and winds up becoming a fascist. And he even says he wants to create an American fascist party. 
and uh, he become he's a major America firster, which uh, at the time was really meant and still does today a kind of uh, extreme right idea that uh, we need to be uh, only concerned with American things, build walls, and keep all sorts of people out, such as the Jews who are fleeing the Holocaust that is coming up. Um, and um, so very unsavory character, but I think we need to mention that, that, that uh, to remind us of that time. Um, but it is an influential show and it will be something that provides a context for the birth of modern domestic architecture in this country, besides what, say, Wright is doing. And, and of course, there are some other architects in Los Angeles, like Richard Neutra and uh, Rudolf Schindler, uh, who are doing modernism, particularly, again, in Los Angeles um, at the time, but that's beyond my purview today. Now, um, if I gave you some a dark, um, a dark accounting of Johnson. Uh, there's both darkness and light in Montclair. Um, in 1940, with a remarkable modern building, uh, the St. Peter Claver Church, uh, which is a modern church built in Montclair by the African American community in 1940, right before the war starts. Um, the shame of this is that uh, in uh, African American Catholics were being forced to sit in the basement of Immaculate Conception Church and listen to the liturgy over the PA. Um, they set out to create a new place of worship uh, in which where they wouldn't have to do that. And in 1931, the Newark Archdiocese lets them create the St. Peter Claver mission. They rent a private house on Elm Street and eventually uh, build a new church in Elmwood for which they raise $53,000. Uh, the church is obviously still there today. Um, the architects are Riley and Hall, uh, who also built the Wellmont Theater. This is done in a much more modern style than the Wellmont, of course. And they have um, by a man named Albert Hoffman, who's the chief designer. Um, this building actually gets press uh, uh, in uh, the art, gets actually the most press of any, any modern building to this point in Montclair uh, in the architecture magazines. There are quite a few articles about it at the time. Um, and this is an image from one of those articles of the interior. I think this is an example of not having much money, but doing the most for the least. And I'll also say my father was a church interior designer, and this is better than anything he ever did, even though he was a pretty good painter later on, but uh, really, a really a fabulous interior. Uh, I have not been to see how much of this is still extant, but um, really, uh, really quite a great building. Uh, and here's one slide actually from one of the architecture magazines showing the parishioners. Um, again, um, really a, a pretty remarkable project. Now, when Americans, when uh, the GIs march off to war and um, the young women of America begin to work in factories and uh, to replace them uh, and also volunteer for the military, you're beginning to deal with a generation that has grown up with technology and is kind of uh, wants to leave the old past behind. Uh, they're going to be accustomed to new things. And a part of that is going to be an attempt by modern architects and others to sell modern architecture to them. And what do they want to do first? Well, of course, they want to settle in new houses and they want to furnish those houses. So in uh, 1947, uh, a man named Carl Fish opens up Hampton House, which is a renovation of an existing building built in 1890. Uh, anyone in Montclair should know this. It's again, very iconic at the corner of Bloomfield and, um, and Fullerton. Uh, and uh, Hampton House is, uh, uh, it, according to the Times, uh, this store will be the first to install a visual type of window front that affords passersby a view of the whole first floor display. So you can see that here. Um, he also, uh, also uh, in what on the close on the occasion of the closing of this of the building, um, the his, his daughter uh, the built the, the Hampton House uh, store remained in the family until closing a few years ago. Uh, his daughter recalls. Uh, quote, right after the war, it was gracious living. The GIs had the money, they married their high school sweethearts, and they bought homes. Everybody wanted a piece of America. It was a wonderful life because they were more family and home oriented, unquote. And um, Carl Fish in 1947, uh, well, obviously that also means, guess what they're doing? They're buying furniture. However, in reminding us of our own plight today, oops, 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 don't do that. Um, Carl Fish says, better furniture is still difficult to obtain. Uh, so that reminds us of the state of rationing at the time. 
Okay, another store that is that opens at this time is uh, Hain and Company, uh, built in 1951, uh, and this is a store on the on the site of the Siena. Uh, the designers are Fellheimer and Wagner of New York. Again, a kind of uh, in this case, a kind of streamlined modern building uh, with some curves to it, um, kind of uh, in, uh, not not a kind of very much in line with the kind of commercial architecture of the day. And uh, this is the interior uh, with this kind of sweeping staircase uh, worthy of the architect Morris Lapidus, who, did, who uh, was a kind of great commercial designer, interiors designer of the time, for those of you familiar with him. Uh, and, uh, and this is part of a general interest in rethinking downtown Montclair uh, in Ira Smith's talk also on YouTube um, called A Past Future. He talks about um, Walter Darwin Teague, the king of streamlined design and his project for Bloomfield Avenue. This is a screenshot from that talk. Um, I will leave that for you. This is the current police station um, that at the time, the town building, and I quite like this little gas station that uh, was, was put in there. Um, but obviously this isn't built. Now, onto what's happening, what else is happening? Um, again, after the war, the international style um, is actually becomes recovered. Johnson winds up back at MoMA, recuperated, and um, his kind of his past uh, whitewashed away. And uh, the international style begins to be yoked to American business and the American way of life. Uh, Manhattan is plowing into modernism, perhaps as it is today, uh, you know, building, uh, building wild new skyscrapers. In this case, this is the, uh, at 53rd and Park. This is Lever uh, House uh, for the soap company Lever Brothers. Uh, and uh, this building obviously has very clean, these kind of very clean lines. It's by Skidmore, Gordon Bunshaft, Skidmore Owings and Merrill. Uh, the building has integrated window washer units, very appropriate for a clean soap company. Um, the building has a very impressive uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. It even has uh, okay, uh, computers on this level. This level, there's actually the cafeteria is here, and this is called the IBM level, where IBM has their machinery. Uh, and so this functionalist, this building is both functionalist, but also iconic and speaks of the post-war corporation, a kind of a, the grid of the, the post-war corporation kind of legible on the facade. This is, say, the beginning of the world of Mad Men. Um, and it also is, again, a very ideological. Um, it is it, the country, and by this I mean, you know, agencies like the U.S. Information Agency, the CIA, but also uh, museums like the Museum of Modern Art and others, writers really pit American modernism against the outdated um, Soviet uh, neoclassicism that they also associate with Nazism. So architecture, the modernism of America is pitted against the, uh, the kind of uh, outrageously uh, kitschy architecture of, uh, of communism at the time. And is kind of seen as a kind of equivalent to, uh, to the Lysenkoism in, in Soviet agriculture. Uh, and of course, uh, there's also that embrace of the European diaspora. Remember, I mentioned Walter Gropius and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. This is a building right next door. Uh, Lever House is down here, uh, Caddy Corner across from the Seagram building, built in 1958 by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Um, so again, a, a, a great architect of the German diaspora building, one of his greatest projects here, uh, not far, 15 miles from Montclair in, in uh, New York City both a capitalist logic, um, but also kind of purity of, of form um, that is in, intended to be fitting for this new culture. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, Mies van der Rohe does uh, three buildings uh, in uh, locally uh, in Newark. This is the Colonnade Apartments and the Pavilion Apartments are right next to it. You can see them from your, the, uh, the Newark stop in, uh, on the Montclair line into the city. Uh, these are easily the most affordable uh, apartments by Mies to live in anywhere. If, you, uh, if you're looking for an apartment, move there now. They're quite amazing. Uh, but, so, uh, but that for those kind of architects, that'll be as close as we come to Montclair. Uh, and there is a debate. This, is, this isn't all just uh, adopted wholesale. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright might be seen as uh, is still alive. He uh, was born in 1867 and dies in 1959. And by the, by the 1940s is kind of the eminence grease of modern architecture and likes to let everybody know this. Um, 
at this, so Wright's tradition uh, has been ongoing and he's been innovating the entire time on his own trajectory. Uh, he, in 1932, he publishes a very popular book called An Autobiography. And in 1938, he makes the cover of Time Magazine. In the article uh, entitled Usonian Architect, uh, Wright dis describes his name of Usonia. Usonia is his name for the USA. Uh, and it is meant to be a new name freed from European tradition. Um, and it is meant to speak of a, uh, an architecture that too will be freed of European conventions and will respond to the American landscape. Uh, and you can also see, by the way, Falling Water, his iconic building in the background of uh, on Time Magazine. Uh, the Usonian homes are, uh, they're about, uh, are a series of houses about six to 140 he builds that are intended to be affordable for young families. Um, these are houses, uh, this is a house built for Herbert Jacobs in Wisconsin. He challenges Wright to create a decent home for $5,000 and it, Wright considers this his first Usonian structure. Uh, these houses are have no foundation, no basement, no front porch. Uh, there will be carports, Wright loves carports. Um, they're related directly to the earth in that sense. They can, uh, they, uh, the floor actually also has radiant heating uh, insert, uh, embedded in it. Uh, the, there's a typical glass curtain wall. Uh, there are natural materials such as brick, wood, sometimes uh, uh, stone. Uh, again, further tying the houses to the landscape. Typically one story uh, horizontal in orientation with very low simple roofs. The kind of development of the prairie style. Uh, these Clara story windows are very important throughout. Uh, of course, there's no attic, um, and they're off. They're typically blueprinted with a simple grid pattern. One of the gems of uh, modern architecture uh, in this area is the uh, Stuart Richardson House in Glen Ridge. It is an 800 square foot home in 1941, built for actuary Stuart Richardson and his wife, who can. Um, apparently consulted Wright while he was in New York City working on the Guggenheim. I got a chance to visit this wonderful house by, um, when Edith Payne, uh, two owners ago, and a longtime owner of the house uh, was selling it. And I snuck in with a uh, real estate agent's tour and I wasn't supposed to do that, but she was very excited to hear an architecture historian taking interest. She gave me a great tour. And I, even though I'll be honest, I don't love Wright's residential designs and I wanted to buy this house. And I thought, what can we do to move in here? Uh, it is such a spectacular property. It is now owned by Todd Levin, a curator. Uh, and uh, he's done great work with it. Um, and um, it's an 1800 square foot brick home uh, on a half acre uh, lot at the end of a cul-de-sac where it is very incongruous. Actually, we'll talk about that in a minute. It is built in 1951. It has three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Uh, it has a heated and ground pool. And in this case, it's based on a hexagonal grid system reflected through the entire home in everything from the floor tiles to the shape of the shower. Everything is, all the rooms are formed by 60 and 120 degree angles. There are no right angles in the floor plan. Uh, this probably contributed to the expense uh, and the constructional, because it created more constructional complexity. This is uh, the Vigo Sunt House in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, an image drawn by Wright's office, which is one reason I wanted to show it to you. You can see this kind of uh, aesthetic inf that Wright had been using since the 1900s influenced by Japanese uh, drawing of the uh, that he had seen. Uh, you can see this house is meant to be a summer house on a lake. It's a little sailboat there. And um, supposedly the Richardson house is based on the Sund house. And I, I have no, re the reason I'm saying supposedly is that um, I've, uh, since during, during research on this, um, I found out that, um, well, Sund doesn't build the house. Sund gives up starts in 1941 and he gives up by 1948. And similarly, the Richardson house is started in 1941. Um, and at one point in Sun's letters, he states that he, um, he likes the Richardson, what is happening with the Richardson house and wants to see uh, his house expand the way the Richardson house has. Um, now, this is actually the Sun house and you can see there's a, a hexagonal grid on it. Uh, you can see the carport here. There's a kind of a loggia, a living area, um, kitchen, utilities, a guest room. Uh, there's a um, guest room or study and a bedroom. 
And meanwhile, the Livingston, the Richardson House for Livingston, which is originally where it's supposed to be, is very similar. The, uh, it's just a little bit, parts of it are flipped. There's a carport, now the living area is here, the entrance loggia is here, um, and the kitchen is kind of displaced. Uh, and then there's a bedroom and a study and a bath. This is an early version. Already the house is called Scherzo, which reflect, reflects uh, Richardson's love of music. Um, there are wartime shortages, very little construction is built anywhere in the country. So neither house moves forward. The Sund house is abandoned, but the Richardson house is completed. As you can see in this, in this more recent drawing that is clearer to read, um, you can see that here's the carport, there is a entrance into the kitchen if you have groceries. Otherwise, if you're a guest, you come in the formal entry into the living area here. There's a wraparound, there's a table, a built-in dining table, a wraparound dining into the works, into the kitchen. Uh, and then there's um, a space that leads into a study, into a bathroom for the two bed children's bedrooms. And then there's a master suite with a dressing area um, or mini study and a bathroom uh, with a shower here. Again, uh, no right angles inside the, um, all, all hexa hexagons. Um, you can see it here at the end of this cul-de-sac. Um, and the cul-de-sac does look quite odd. Uh, I mean, it, does, it looks not quite odd. It looks very typical of New Jersey. It actually doesn't look very typical of Glen Ridge. But um, here's the cul-de-sac, the, and there's the entrance. You don't expect a right house there, that's for sure. Uh, it turns out that that area had been uh, home to a factory that I can't resist talking about because it has this amazing uh, ads. It was called the Mojo Factory, and it was founded by a man named Robert Legrand Johnston, who uh, developed a formula for making chewing gum and uh, had the factory built on the site to produce Mojo. And the recipe was a secret and reputedly it died with him. So the family gave up and demolished the factory and then sold the property. Um, so the interior of the house, now we can see here's the living area. Um, there's that, you can look into the kitchen area there. There's the dining area. This is the entrance comes in here. Off to the side, oh wait, first up here is it, the clerestory windows with the kind of um, in them are these carve outs that are supposed to be like musical notation. Um, maybe by John Cage or something, or maybe from Rory and Chance, certainly not conventional musical notation, but there it is. And this is what this is exactly what it looks like. It is a music nook for um, for records, which I just love. I think that's great. Uh, here's a look uh, again into that nook. You can see the outside here, the dining area. You can see the hexagonal floor clearly here. Again, the way the clerestory lighting works. A view now that reveals the fireplace. So behind where that kitchen, um, behind where that couch was, it's a really spectacular house. I mean, look at that ceiling. It's just all the woodwork. You can see why it did go over budget uh, considerably, uh, but it certainly was worth every penny. Um, and uh, just a fabulous house. Again, a view of the dining area, a view into the kitchen. The kitchen is not original. It was built, uh, renovated by Edith Payne. These screens were remo are removed by Todd Levin. They're very uncharacteristic of right. Uh, the carport has been restored. Uh, notice that there's a skylight here and also a, a kind of triangular light, very popular uh, used in the Guggenheim, for example, uh, by, by right. Um, Here's a view into the bedroom. I love this fireplace. It's quite big, but I really do love it. Um, this is a view of the dressing area or study next to it, and another view of the bedroom. Uh, again, the Clara story. Uh, windows, cypress planked walls, the study, uh, the master study. Boy, I would have loved to have had my study there, but, but this isn't bad. Um, I'm now going to go through, so that, that ends us with the right, and I'm going to go through a a more rapid look um, through uh, some of the local structures uh, to um, to bring us up to uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, this is a house at um, at 28. I think it's Park. Is it Parkview or Parkside? Uh, right on the south end of Anderson Park. Uh, it's by Arthur Ramhurst, who is a local architect. He does a lot of traditional work. He does a lot of Center Hall colonials, Tudor esque stuff. A couple, one one or two things and watch one thing in Watchung Plaza, uh, but in in 1946, right after the war, he has a chance to build his own house and he goes crazy. And he builds a really stellar house. I think this is a, it's a really unusual structure um, that in, 
speaks of a, a very different conception of architecture, real originality. And that leads us to this other theme, which is the idea of showpiece houses for architects, because we're going to see a lot of those now. Um, I don't have any good pictures of the interior. I have been inside once, um, and, and the owner was gracious enough to show me, and it is a, as spectacular inside as it is outside. Um, but it also becomes, again, it is a kind of a one-off and an unusual project. And instead, what I'll be looking at is uh, there are a whole series of houses on Highland Avenue. Most of these are going to be on Highland, not all. Uh, and Highland, I always like to call the Hollywood Hills of Montclair uh, or the Hollywood Hills of New Jersey. Uh, the, this, in fact, by the way, is, in case you didn't know, is not Montclair. This is the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles. Uh, what together, both of these are places of post-war experimentation for modern architects who seek to use leftover building sites that are very difficult to build on. Uh, the, I mean, I'm showing you Los Angeles because post-war domestic architecture is very influenced by what happens there, particularly by the case study house program run by John Intenza uh, in his magazine, Art and Architecture. His goal is to build an expensive houses. Uh, they all turned out to be very expensive uh, using high technology in the very center of post-war high tech um, Los, Los Angeles, which is where both the defense industry is really located at the time. Think of Northrop Grumman, um, uh, and Lockheed and so forth. Think of all the space space stuff built there, uh, outer space stuff that, uh, oh, Hughes Aircraft is there, of course, uh, and Hollywood too, um, don't forget Hollywood. So a very kind of progressive and technologically uh, forward looking uh, culture. And by this, I mean progressive both politically and also uh, technologically. Uh, this building is case study house number 22, one of the gl most glorious of the case study houses built by Pierre Koenig um, and uh, perched on top of this cliff. The site is extremely small. There's really nothing besides the house. And if you look at, the, at this image of the house uh, taken by the photographer Julia Shulman, uh, there's a great documentary on Julia Shulman. Uh, it's called Visual Acoustics. Yours truly is featured in it. Um, and the uh, Shulman sold a message of glamour uh, to the public through his photography. Uh, this is just such an iconic photo of these women uh, sitting in this house, uh, perched over the Los Angeles landscape, the city in the distance. And I think that um, you, know, you can begin to see the, re the relationship of this to Highland, you know, a place where, you know, obviously so many of you like to walk, uh, at least I'm judging from how popular the street is, uh, to look, take in the views of the city. This is the, the highest point uh, west of uh, Portugal, apart from the skyscrapers of New York City. And um, it, uh, it can be fabulous. And also, um, I, I think that a few of you at least must enjoy the modern uh, architecture of the area. Now, why Highland? Well, because the south side in particular, but also some of the buildings on the north side are not developed well into the 1960s and even later. Uh, you can see that the houses in Upper Mountain, the large estates, had these properties that went all the way through. Uh, by the 1970s, um, and actually even earlier, um, the by the 1960s, uh, these lots begin to get subdivided. Uh, taxes, as you, those of you who live in town know, are very expensive here, even then. Um, why, have, why pay taxes on part of your property that you don't use when you can sell it and develop it? So, and so that is done. Um, so also, I believe, and if many of you know this for sure, you know, let me know, uh, part of Highland, maybe this part between, uh, and by the way, the part I'm mainly going to talk about, although not exclusively, is between Bradford, sorry, yeah, Bradford, or let's say Ingleside and Edgewood and maybe all the way to Claremont, if you will. And uh, part of this, at least, I believe, was a dirt road, at least, uh, at least until the war. Uh, and I have gone through the entire Montclair Times uh, back issues looking for, for Highland Avenue. So uh, I know a lot about Highland Avenue. We've wanted to speed bump since the 1950s, let me tell you that. All right, um, I'm going to begin Highland with um, this 1961 house for um, which I'm only going to show you one image of because it has been extensively renovated and I cannot tell you what is left of the interior at all. Um, but the exterior is uh, for a structural engineer named August Commandant uh, and his partner Helmi Aaron. It is a 205 Highland. The architect is from Cedar Grove. His name is Oswald Mitt. Uh, Commandant Aaron and Mitt are all Estonians um, and 
they, here's, here's Commandant, um, they are all refugees who fled during the war uh, or after and after the or after the war, really during the war, but they arrived in the US after the war. Uh, Commandant begins working in Estonia. He's born in 1906. He studies in Dresden. There's actually been a recent retrospective of his work in Estonia in the Estonian Museum of, of Modern Architecture. He lives as a displaced person in Germany working for the US Army. Uh, and until 1950, when he and his wife and children receive approval to immigrate to the US. Uh, but in the meantime, he has met Helmi Ahrens, uh, an actress and singer in operettas and musicals, quite important at the time. Um, she becomes his partner. Uh, they move to New York. The wife and children move to Long Island. Um, they, and uh, they, she winds up, after her musical career concludes, she winds up serving as his assistant. She's very talented in mathematics and technical drawing and continue, works closely with him, uh, signing his drawings. So very, she's a very interesting character herself. Um, he's a pioneer in what's called pre-stressed concrete, which I don't have time to go into. But in 1952, it's a way of making concrete stronger. Uh, he publishes a book on pre-stressed concrete and becomes very well known among structural engineers and architects. and uh, Oswald Mitt, meanwhile, has a house at 164 Claremont in Verona. And he, I think, principally works for other firms, but he does the, the house for, uh, for Commandant. And by the way, the, the town initially refuses to give a permit for the house due to the steep, slight, the steep nature of the site. But Commandant being uh, really one of the world's greatest structural engineers, right up there with Ovi Arab, um, York Schlake, um, uh, Fazlur Khan, and, um, and others of the, of the 20th century, uh, he convinces the town that this will be just fine. You can just imagine him saying, it'll be just fine, just trust me. Uh, it, he, soon after the publication of his book in the early 50s, he meets another Estonian architect, Louis Kahn, much more famous than Oswald Mitt. Um, the first project they do together is also Kahn's first major project, the Richards Medical Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Both architects believe that structure should not be hidden, but rather should be expressed. Um, you can see the incredible concrete work on the laboratories. Won't go into what how this is built because we don't have that much time. This is a quick survey. Um, the Kimball Art Museum uh, here in 1972 two in Fort Worth. Uh, he also publishes, uh, this is one of the last projects with Kahn. He publishes a book called 18 Years with Architect Louis Kahn in 1975. It is quite catty. And um, although the book is published a year after Kahn's death, Kahn must have known it was coming because Kahn complains about how catty um, uh, Commandant is and the Commandant takes too much credit, takes all the credit for Kahn's innovations. Be that as it may, Con Commandant was certainly a genius. This is Habitat 67, for which he's also the, the structural engineer uh, by the Israeli-American architect Moshe Safdi. This is in Montreal, just a fabulous project as well. Uh, very, very quick. I'm going to go through a bunch of houses very quickly, um, in some cases because I don't have time to talk about them, in one case, uh, in some cases because I don't have enough information. Uh, in this case, I just want to tell you about this because you have to visit if you haven't been. This is the House of Landscape Architect James Rose in Ridgewood, so far from unclear, but really worth seeing. It is open to the public. Go look it up on the web. Uh, it is, he is a landscape architect. Uh, but he builds this incredibly strange project that is reminiscent of something Rudolf Schindler might have done. Uh, it is a spectacular, something from Los Angeles almost. Uh, it is a spectacular pro property influenced very much by a Japanese aesthetic, thoroughly unconventional. Here's a couple of views of it, another view of it. Um, and um, it, it is, uh, you can take a tour. Uh, and if you like Szechuan, there's truly Szechuan in Ridgewood, go, go there afterwards, you'll have a good time. Uh, so highly, highly recommend this project. And I'm trying to find out more about the gardens he did in our, in our area. Uh, and I, that is another project. So just a taste of one of the best houses in New Jersey period that you can visit. This is a house uh, by the architect Vladislaw or Walter Kowetsky, another, um, another emigre. Uh, it is a 28 Mountainside Park Terrace. It is published in uh, this magazine, House and Home. You can see houses for hilly sites. So as I said, these houses are built for difficult sites that nobody else wants to build on. I don't have very much information about this house at all. It has been very strangely renovated. So I cannot uh, touch, I will not show you the interiors. 
uh, when I first saw it after the, the owners who had renovated um, and the only time I've seen the interior about 10 years ago, um, there was a, pol a stuffed polar bear in there. It was very odd. Um, and um, however, the, the one thing I will mention is that uh, the sculptor, uh, uh, his, his wife was a sculptor and her name was Jean Kowetsky. I believe that might be one of her sculptures. I don't know, it looks like it. And she was one of the co-founders of Studio Montclair. So um, she's passed away, but uh, another interesting figure and another uh, sort of power couple here. Another house I will just tell you in case you are interested in architecture of the late 20th century in Essex Fells at 183 Devon Road is the very first house of Richard Meyer, the house for his parents. Um, he is a famous architect who builds uh, work like the High Museum in Atlanta and the Getty Center in Los Angeles. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, one of the title shots of for this lecture was this house. Um, this time by architect Harry B. Mahler. It is a 214 Highland. It is on the one of the modern houses on the uphill side of Highland. Uh, it is. It makes the most of the view of New York City by raising itself off the ground. There's a garage in here, and I believe utilities over here. Maybe some other rooms, and you can see this kind of um, these kind of these this roof line that carries through the entire house. Oops, that is not the house. What did I just do? I am very sorry. Um, it, it carries through the entire house and you can see they're kind of like almost like tunnels through the house uh, that really emphasize the directionality of the house looking towards the city. Um, so um, also very interesting house. Um, he is, um, Harry Mahler doesn't build any other houses. Um, he graduates Columbia University, and before he graduates, he works for Frank Grad and Sons or Grad Associates based in Newark, and winds up doing large commercial projects like Continental Terminal, I believe Terminal C at Newark, uh, the Brendan Byrne Arena, later the Izod Center, which is where he's pictured, uh, and taught at Pratt and chaired a committee that resulted in establishing uh, the architecture school at uh, the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, so an interesting character, this is the interior of the house. Um, and uh, the previous owner, William Kaplan, told me that uh, the fact that he was a commercial architect made it really fun to have to replace the plumbing because it was all commercial in, uh, in sourcing uh, from the 1960s. So good luck replacing that. Um, another house built by an architect um, is the Gerald Volk House. It is in Cedar Grove, right over the border on Old Quarry Road next to Mills Reservation. Uh, I really love this house. Um, it is um, maybe influenced a little bit by the work of architects like Philip Johnson, I think, but really Volk was, Gerald Volk was a really original architect uh, in, the, in town. He did a lot of interesting projects uh, and I just am beginning to learn about him. He was based in Upper Montclair. Uh, this is a house that, plays with the ideas of privacy, towards, so towards the public privacy, there's a model of it. It wins an award uh, in New Jersey, from the New Jersey American Institute of Architecture. This is, um, if this name, somebody asked, give the name again, if you mean this, this is uh, Valk. Uh, you'll find out in a second because it is Valk and Kion uh, are the architects. Uh, the, previous house, the previous house was by Harry Mahler. So hopefully that helps you. Um, so Valk and Kuan are young architects who start up in Upper Montclair. And you can see that this house has this, um, this living area, dining area here with a kitchen off to the side, bedrooms here, kind of utility in these pavilions, separating those out very neatly. That's really cool. One story building. Uh, this nice interior, it's been renovated a bit, but uh, probably still gives you a real idea of what the house looked like. Um, they're they're award-winning uh, local architects. They do a bunch of interesting things. Uh, if you've ever wondered about the weird animal, Caldwell Animal Hospital out on Bloomfield, that very futuristic project, they did that. They also did uh, the Olympic shop in Upper Montclair, renovating a building from 1929 and 1969. And although I have only very terrible photos of it, I do. I did really like this building, and I'm saddened that the it has been replaced by a Tudor esque building that I that is supposedly contextual and I don't think fits at all. Sorry if you don't agree, but that is my opinion, my professional opinion. Um, I actually love the way that uh, this building uses these large circular windows to display, the, as well as this arch to display um, to display items, and I think it speaks of the fact that uh, preserving 
preservation can sometimes be a battle. Do you preserve a district? Do you restore it to something it never has, um, towards something that never has been, like a different Tudor building that never, not the original? Um, and I think it's, it is an interesting and curious building. It also speaks of the fact that we're very willing to ignore modernism or consider it somehow um, maybe not so interesting. Although that's changing, especially because that Commandant house sold for around $3 million recently. Um, a building that those of you in Montclair and, Ver and the surrounding towns know well is um, right on Claremont, in between Claremont and Bloomfield. Um, this is actually the offices of Van Volk and uh, later the Milan Architecture Group. It is this, again, a, a leftover site with some incredibly difficult boulders on it. Um, and it is, I think it's really spectacular. It's built in 1970. Uh, it incorporates, it sits on the natural landscape, but doesn't obliterate it. It incorporates it into the interior, which is just so amazing, I think. Um, and is hopefully a building that uh, it's been recently sold. I hope it, uh, it's in good hands. Um, again, it, it's, I think it's quite, quite amazing. Uh, and, and actually soon will be well eligible for historic preservation. Wait, it is. Um, so, you know, uh, just, a reminder, those of you who are in interest, who are involved in historic preservation, some of this stuff is completely eligible and uh, really is part of our, very much part of our history. Uh, and I'm going to conclude now. I know I'm a little bit running a little bit long, but uh, I've skipped so much. And as you, if you've been listening, I've been going on, going uh, a mile a minute on this. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with, uh, as promised, with deck houses, which uh, form a kind of ensemble in between. Ingleside and uh, Edge, Edgewood, um, and I always get the name of that street wrong. And um, there, are, there are seven of them, 165, 181, 197, 259, 265, 280, and 287. Um, the earliest, which is 287, the, so the northernmost is in 1974, and the rest date from between 1979 and 1983. I visited, hmm, all but one of these, uh, and I've visited all but the latest. Uh, the this is uh, this actually is 280 Highland, uh, and uh, these um, I think that the deck, deck houses are a really spectacular form of architecture that really tries to engage with prefabrication. Uh, the deck house company still exists. Um, it, there are some uh, eleven thousand of these houses throughout the world, five hundred of them um, are, are not in the US and the rest are in the US. Uh, I'll give you some statistics in a minute on the ones in, um, in uh, New Jersey. But uh, they come out of a firm, the, the shards of a firm called TechBuild, which is uh, known to architecture historians as a major constructor of prefab houses. Uh, it folds in 1959 though, but you can see some of the similarities to deck houses, uh, kind of post and beam construction, very typically a cathedral ceiling um, and um, a kind of um, obviously a kind of very modern look to it. But I'm gonna skip over deck tech built. It gets enough praise in, uh, in for example, MoMA did a, the Museum of Modern Art recently did a show on prefab and they included tech built and they didn't include deck house, even though deck house has done much, much more than they did. Uh, prefabrication is a kind of a, a dream for architects ever since, let's say at least Edison. Uh, in fact, one of my thesis students in the, in the 1990s, Rocio Romero, uh, she, did, she founded a firm called uh, LV Home uh, and created uh, the LV Home in the 2000s and sold a bunch of those. But Deck House, uh, again, founded in 1960 by a graduate of Harvard Graduate School of Design, student of Walter Gropius's, William J. Berkey's, um, and another man named Robert Brownwell. This firm is still in existence today. I just talked to them. Uh, there are some three, I found out there are some 391 uh, houses in Jersey. There are likely more, mainly houses. Some are businesses. There are like 20 in Hopewell. Uh, 11 in Kinelon, 10 in Homedale, one in Cedar Grove, one on the border of Montclair and Cedar Grove. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about deck houses and then just show you my house and, um, and finish up uh, with another couple of images and then that'll be it. Uh, but I want to quote from you from their literature of which there was a lot. This is uh, their logo, the deck house logo, kind of a tree with this cube in it, kind of pretty. Um, they, um, they say, uh, the, the literature says, quote, houses are created by architects and builders. 
Homes are made by families. The primary interest of Deck House is to design and build the kind of house that will offer maximum potential and homemaking possibilities. There are also the more subtle psychological urgings, often contradictory, as in the wish to be free, uncaged, and yet to be enveloped and protected, to be an intimate witness to a winter storm, and yet be sheltered and warm, to live as a nonconformist, and yet be accepted as a respected citizen of the community. Taking such human needs to be the legitimate concern of architects, we made the satisfaction of these needs the underlying premise of the deck house concept. This is the factory, which I've had a chance to visit. It's still there. Um, and uh, they, they, you, if you buy a deck house, you can get windows from them uh, made of mahogany. They will ship them to Montclair or whatever community you're in. If you want to build a new deck house, you certainly can, although they do look a little different today. Um, and you know, it's kind of a great deal because if you have to replace your mahogany sliders or doors or whatever, um, you have to buy it from them if you want it to look original. So they have quite a production line going. This is my house uh, where I live with uh, my wife and kids and uh, cat, and uh, it is a 265 Highland. Again, down a hill, as I would, as I suggested. Um, these many of these sites are hilly, and deck houses really are typically built on hillsides. Um, here is a a bunch of deck houses here from their literature. Um, one of the things about deck houses, I'm gonna show you this image of, of the side image of my house. Again, they're typically built on hills and they are split level. So there's an entrance door with a steer that goes up to a living area and, a, and the adults' bedrooms. There is typically no attic or very minimal attic uh, to give you soaring interior ceilings so your spirit may soar so you can get light com coming in. Uh, and then the kids are in the lower level so they can just run out into the yard if they, um, whenever they want. That is the theory behind the deck house and that they have their own space separate from the adults. Now, uh, if you look at the, interior, ex the exterior of the house, uh, I have ex extensively restored it. Uh, we spent about a year restoring the exterior. It took a lot of time. Um, the, it, it, this is a rare one with an exterior of mahogany. Most were done in cedar, sited in cedar. Uh, my, ours was really stained rather badly but, uh, by previous owners, so we felt we really needed to, uh, to deal with that, and we did. Um, and so the exterior has been completely redone um, by, uh, I mean, well, the, the stripped and stained. Uh, with a program that we can maintain over time. The last thing to do is the roof, which is happening in uh, about a week. Uh, well, I just think the project starts Monday. Um, the roof just needs to be replaced, nothing too dramatic, uh, but part of the preservation of it. So there's that. If Let's take a look at the literature. They have tons and tons of different plans. Again, there are, there are over 11,000 houses. No plan is the same. This plan is uh, published in one of their pamphlets. And you can see that you enter into the house. You can either go down to a family room, the kids' bedrooms, where there's a bathroom and some other spaces, or you can go up. And if you go up, you will wind up in the living area, the dining area, the kitchen where entertainment happens, or you'll wind up in the master bedroom. Um, and there's a, a in-suite dressing room and bath. There's also a powder room. Uh, there's a deck out here. And in fact, this is virtually the plan of my house, uh, except that the garage, there's no mud room and the garage is in line here. So, uh, and there's also a lower level, a basement level. So uh, that means that this, these things are stuck down there. So, um, but the house is not built, let's say it's not hauled here all on a truck. Um, various pieces are pre-manufactured, pre -manufactured, such as the siding, the windows, um, the posts and beams, but it is very much up to the contractor to build it locally. Um, and, um, and it is not, let's say, you know, it's not just a giant panels being shipped here. Um, the siding will be little bits when it gets here. Um, again, typically they have decks, although that is not why it's called a deck house. I uh, will get into that in a minute. Um, here you can see from this little drone shot uh, what it looks like. This door is new. Uh, after uh, the hurricanes, uh, we decided we needed egress from the basement. And also because the house was never intended to be this far off the ground, the blueprints show it being the ground level being right here. Um, so we decided we wanted egress from the basement for the kids and us. Um, we enclosed the lower level of the deck. This area used to be screened in. It is also now, um, it's been opened up. 
Um, this is a view of the interior uh, and early when soon after we moved in. Uh, there, here you can see the typical construction. It, there are posts here and here uh, and here. Uh, every eight feet, there is a post. Um, so it's an eight foot modular grid. Uh, and there is, actually the post will be here, I'm sorry. Um, and there is, uh, and then there are, there are these glue lamb Douglas fir beams that support this structural cedar decking. Many people, including architects, don't believe me when I tell them that this thing is um, three inches thick. It is really thick tongue and groove decking that provides, uh, prevents, uh, that takes loads very well and also prevents shearing that might otherwise, uh, shearing forces that might otherwise be at play with a post and beam construction. Uh, and that is why it is actually called the deck house because of these characteristic cedar ceilings um, here too. Uh, typically, every deck house, I, I believe, has a, a fireplace. We have a fireplace insert uh, to be more less polluting and more efficient, uh, and also helps during the hurricanes when our power is off. But nevertheless, um, so these are again some images of my of our house. Um, a characteristic feature of a deck house is the mahogany waffle door built of. Um, little bits of mahogany that are left over in the, uh, in the factory. Uh, and um, they, again, deck houses still have these to this day. Uh, they are a bear to refinish, but they're well worth it. I'm gonna finish with uh, a couple of other images of uh, my friend Peter and Alejandra's house. Um, also a deck house that's also very lovely. Um, and again, speaking of, of, threat, of threats, uh, when they purchased, they purchased the house, they were, the, I believe, the, um, they, for, they previous, previously to them, the original owner had sold it, and the original purchaser, uh, who will remain nameless, um, what, wanted to tear it down, uh, which I think would have been an incredible shame because it's just a gorgeous little jewel box uh, of a house. Um, and uh, you know, with this raking carport that just uh, that just comes off the roof line, and uh, I mean, just really beautiful house um, has a just a lovely interior. Uh, again, the kind of the, the fireplace. Uh, have enjoyed glasses of wine, listening to uh, their stereo here many times, uh, and um, and again, you know, a continuity to the dining area and the kitchen. Uh, again, you can see the post. So. There's a post here. So again, you can you can really, if, if you wanted to, you could really change around the walls of the house uh, to some degree at will, if, if that kind of thing suits your fancy. One final image um, here shows you uh, just again some of the detailing, the mahogany window, window frames, the cedar decking, uh, these oriental ash, uh, as they're called, um, doors, which were the original um, doors for the uh, for for the closets. Um, and I believe, I believe that's everything then. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Kaziz. Yeah, I'm going to check sure. the chat, see if there are any questions in there. But yeah, if anybody has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and you can go right ahead. <laughs> there were questions about what house in Ridgewood. And yes, that is the James Rose Center. Uh, JamesRoseCenter.org as, um, who's that? Is that Helen said? Yes. yes. Very, very well, well, well worth going to. And they also do, do things today. They have a research program. They have residencies. Uh, it is cool and really unknown. We often think that, I hate to say it, but we often think that outside of Montclair, and, uh, there's a kind of cultural wasteland in Northern Jersey, that there are museums and other worthy things. And in fact, when I, I, I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of this place and their website hadn't been updated for a while. So I thought, well, maybe it's closed down, but no, and it is again, well worth going to. Uh, very interesting place. I have to make sure I, I put that on my bucket list of things to stop at one of these days. Uh, thank you again, and everybody have a great night. Thank you, Kazish. That was really um, very thank informative. You. Thank you. Covered a lot of ground. Oh yeah.